Michelle, I'll be your safari guide here throughout the Harambe Wildlife Reserve this morning. Just a few things to go over before we make our way on in. Please keep those hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the truck at all times. We do go through some rough brush. Some of those bushes have longer thorns. It's also important you remain fully and completely seated throughout the entire reserve. And it goes for adults as well as kids. Parents, please don't hold your kid up in the air or on your lap or pass them around or let them walk around to see the animals. We go over a lot of rough terrain, a lot of potholes. Sometimes we have to make sudden stops. We don't know about having to make until we wind up making them. So just make sure everybody stays seated where they currently are. If people are being passed around or standing up, unfortunately, I can't stop the truck. If you're planning on taking photos, it's perfectly fine. Just have the cameras and cell phones out and ready. I won't be able to stop for every animal today, but there's also no guarantee once they see us, they'll stop. Now, we got all clear from the warden right away, so we've made our way here to the Little Aturi Forest. The animals who call the forest their home are going to be a little bit more shy and reclusive. They really like to use their natural camouflage to blend in throughout all of this dense vegetation to keep themselves nice and safe. So we'll just kind of keep our eyes open, see if we can look out and find anything over here. Today I do spot a larger watering hole up ahead to the left, so we'll go see if we can look out over there. Sometimes we find black rhinos in the area, and I do see one a little bit farther up the hill there to the left as we start to make this turn. You can already see them. Now they'll weigh in at about 3,000 pounds and charge at 35 miles per hour, unfortunately with less than 5,000 in the world today due to the illegal poaching on a daily basis for their keratin warrant. Now, if you're not quite sure what keratin is, Hakuna Matata, no worries. The same stuff to make up our hair and our fingernails. There's another one laying a little bit farther back up that hill. Now a lot of people don't know what keratin is, so it's important we educate ourselves and others about it because poachers will sell it illegally on the black market earning a profit. They also lose their lives due to loss of habitat on a daily basis as well, but with the poaching being a lot greater. Very solitary animal though, during the daytime they'll hang out by themselves rather than hanging out with other rhinos. And over there to that right hand side, way up on the hill, those rust colored animals are called bungos. Known as the ghost of the forest because they're very rarely seen. They will have horns 36 inches in length that slant back allowing them to dive through the brush and not get tangled up. Now unfortunately over the past three generations we've lost around 20% of that bungo population due to deforestation and loss of habitat. So it's important we use our resources wiser. That way we don't continue to tear down their homes as often as we do. Now we're going to leave the forest and we're going to head on up this hill. We're going to make our way on over to the Safi River, home to water dwellers such as the Nile Hippopotamus. Now, during the daytime especially, the hippos like to stay submerged in the water to keep their large bodies nice and cool. But it's a bit cooler right now, so we might look out and find some out on the land. But otherwise, keep your eyes on the water. Look for backs, maybe some eyes peeking out. They kind of look like rocks or logs within the water. I do spot one way up ahead, so we'll make our way on forward. It actually looks like there's a couple yeah. of them. They'll be on the right side, yeah. but there is a lot of river up ahead on the left-hand side. So if you can't get a good view of them as we make our way forward, Hakuna Matata, no worries, we'll pull a little bit further and hopefully find some more. They'll stay in the large numbers, though, known as a bloat. Now, they'll be able to hold their breath for about eight minutes at a time before they float to the surface for a quick breath of air. And as you can see, those hippos are sleeping over there to the right. Even when they're sleeping, their bodies know to naturally rise up to the surface, get the breath, go back under, and stay asleep. And there's a whole bloat right over here to the left as well behind this island. Having their bodies hang out within the water has no effect on them as they are one of the few animals who have a built-in sunscreen throughout their entire body so they don't have to roll around in mud or dirt like rhinos or elephants would have to. Starting out small at only 85 pounds, it takes almost five full years for them to tip the scales at 5,500 pounds, making them one of the most dangerous animals in all of Africa. Even though they're a herbivore, they'll eat about 80 pounds of vegetation per evening, traveling about five miles each night just in search for food. The hippo will take down the Nile crocodile when need be, with jaws that expand 180 degrees, and out on land, they charge at 25 miles an hour. Now, the larger white gray birds, those are pink-backed pelicans, Pink-backed pelican get their name from the coloration they'll receive on their back wings during the mating season of rose pink. With a wingspan anywhere from 7 to 9 feet, that's about as long as this truck is wide, still making them, though, the smallest of the seven species of pelican. They'll stay in smaller groups, though, like you just saw, known as a pod, but they'll stay in larger numbers, around 500 or so. Now we're going to make our way across this bridge in the water. They're called the float out on land. They're called the basque. These are Nile crocodile. C-shaped snouts and toothy grins is how you can tell. Anywhere from 16 to 20 feet in length when fully grown. That's about as long as a giraffe is tall. They'll eat about half of their body weight in one sitting. 
The average crocodile weighs in at about 500 pounds, so eat 250 pounds of meat per meal. Typically smaller fish, but it'll range anywhere from small fish all the way up to hippo, zebra, wildebeest, and even sometimes other crocodile. Allowing them to, to go days, weeks, and all the way up to a month without having to have another meal because of how full their stomachs get. Now, because they eat animals that are a lot larger than them, the crocodile actually break and lose a lot of their teeth that way. But luckily for the crocodile, unlike us, their teeth will continuously grow back in. When they're out on the land, you may notice that some of them will have their jaws open, my friends. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're hungry. Unlike us, a Nile crocodile doesn't actually have sweat glands, so a very easy way to regulate their body temperature, laying out on the land, getting their jaws nice and open, getting the blood flowing through their bodies, that way they don't overheat. Their other easy option is to go into the water and hold their breath for two hours at a time before they need to float to the surface for that breath of air. Out on land, they'll be able to reach a speed of 10 miles per hour. Now, for an animal, that's not that fast, but for an animal of that length, that's pretty quick and still faster than the average human being. But well, we've made our way now out of the Safi River, and are starting to make our way on over to one of my favorite spots here in all of Africa, which is called the Savannah. And a good indication of that is that kind of funny-looking tree over there to that right-hand side called a baobab tree. It's also called an upside-down tree because you look at it, kind of looks like those roots are sticking straight out from the top. Leafless for about nine months out of the year. The other three months it'll actually grow a fruit and in some places you can actually buy that fruit that the baobab tree grows now their trunk is going to be more of a sponge-like texture and the reason that they go leafless for about nine months out of the year is they can store thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of water within that large massive trunk of it so that way it can stay nice and hydrated and any animal with a tusk or horn can go and pierce the sponge-like texture of the trunk, get any water they might need, whether there's no watering hole around or possibly during a dry season, giving that tree then also the nickname the tree of life, obviously providing life for itself, but all the animals who call the savannah their home. Now we're going to start to kind of make our way down this hill nice and poly poly, which means very slowly in Swahili. You can see it's a lot more open out here. We can see a lot of animals up ahead in the distance. Trust me, we will be making our way a lot closer to them. But all the animals that call the savannah their home treat it like their home. As you can see, a lot of trees have been taken down, meaning elephants have been in the area. They're going to act like a bulldozer. They take down trees, they clear out pathways. That allows herds to migrate through. You can kind of gauge how tall the tallest giraffe out on the savannah is going to be based off of where the leaves end on these trees. Again, giraffes grew to be about 20 feet tall. Late the bottoms of the trees, allowing sunlight to shed down on the ground beneath, allowing all of this tall and short grass and the brush to start to regrow because a lot of animals who call the savannah their home, they're going to be more of a hoofstock or the grass grazing type of animal. Once they eat it all up, they'll migrate on out, searching for more food, then allowing all of this to start to regrow. Now, I do see some giraffe way off in the distance to that right-hand side. We're going to follow this pathway and make our way a bit closer to them. As we do, though, we are going to near the edge of the reserve up ahead on the left-hand side, just where the brush line is. Sometimes we look out and we find predators in these areas. Now, with it being a bit cooler, we might actually see some roaming around. Otherwise, when we look in some shaded areas, whether it's underneath trees or bushes, it looks like there might be a den up ahead as well. We'll check over there as well. But a lot of predators, they like to hunt either right away in the morning before it gets too hot out. Some will wait the entire day, hunt during the nighttime when it's cooler. Maybe their eyesight's better. Some will hunt during the dawn and the dusk hour. Just kind of depends on each predator. We'll see if we can look out over here today. Oh, you can kind of see there's a couple of them. They're orange, black, and white animals laying down in that small little dirt pathway. Those are called wild African dogs that are sleeping. Oh. Wild African dog are also known as painted dog for the unique coloration and patchwork they have on their fur. Now they only have four toes instead of five like a regular dog or wolf would have. They don't communicate like a regular dog. They communicate more like a squeak toy noise that you would give your dog a toy. They kind of make that little kind of squeaking noise to communicate with each other. Now that is a smaller pack. It then packs anywhere from two to 15, ran by an alpha male and an alpha female. Hunting during the dawn and dusk oh, yeah. hours though, resting up during the heat of the day. Now, they might look cute and cuddly from a distance. Yeah. They kind of look cute and cuddly up close, but they're actually one of the meanest animals out here on the savannah. They are the top hunter throughout all of Africa. They will chase down their prey till they can no longer run, and it drops from exhaustion. That gives them about a 90 to 95% success rate when it comes to the hunt over other animals such as hyenas, cheetahs, and even the lions. Now, way up on that hill to the left-hand side, those are sable antelope, the official emblem here on the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. You can see those beautiful thin curved horns on top of their other two to five feet in length when fully grown and curved used as a defense mechanism they will throw predators off of their back when being attacked they're actually one of the most aggressive antelope to call the savannah their home as instead of backing down from a fight they will stand their ground protecting their land and protecting their herd 
Now the ones to be in charge will be an alpha male and an alpha female, but that alpha female outranks the alpha male. She makes all the decisions whether they migrate, they drink, they eat, they sleep. Now over here to this left hand side are some assigned giraffe, a group known as a tower when stationary when on the move. They are called the journey. There are some more way up that hill to the left. Obviously, you can see this little one over here to that left-hand side is a baby Maasai giraffe. You can tell they're Maasai based off of their coats, that very messy, jagged pattern on them. One of the younger ones to the left of this female here as well. Obviously, a lot taller than the little one over here. A few months old at this point. So the moms will actually give birth standing up. That baby, when born, is going to be taller than most of the people here on the truck. Six feet tall, weighing in at 150 pounds. Now, by the age of one, they will have doubled in size, standing about 12 feet tall pretty much acting like a teenager by the ages of one to two. And when they're three years old, that's when they're fully grown, standing at a full 18 to 20 feet. Now you may have noticed on top of their head, they had what looked to be like horns. They're actually called ossicones. It's an extra part of their skeletal structure that stick out from the skull of both the male and female giraffes. You can see more migrating up on the hill up there to that left-hand side. Now, obviously there are a lot of differences between us and a giraffe, but one pretty cool thing we have in common, we all have the same amount of vertebrae in our neck, which is seven. Now obviously a lot larger, more spaced out on them, making it easy to reach high up into the trees to get the leaves out of the branches, but to assist with that is a foot and a half long. That's long enough for them to lick their own eyeball. It's a prehensile tongue. They can grip around the leaves and rip them down from the trees with ease, which is great as well for the giraffe because their tongue is gonna have a built-in sunscreen similar to that of the hippo skin. They'll eat about 20 hours a day to fill their four-chambered stomach and only sleep about 30 minutes a day. Two to three minutes at a time, mind you, not all at once, just in smaller shifts. Now, as we make our way for a couple different animals over here besides the Maasai giraffe up ahead, a little tiny tan antelope you see up there, our springbok, from a distance small, up close small, three feet tall, weighing in at 100 pounds. One of the top 10 fastest land animals though in the world and the second fastest here on the reserve at 60 miles an hour, all while running in a zigzag pattern to tire out their predator. They can also spring six feet in the air and about 13 feet forward, known as pronking. Near them was a smaller herd of white bearded wildebeest. They'll take part in the largest migration per year with 1.5 million. They'll travel about a thousand miles each year and can go about five days without having any water. Within the first 15 minutes after being born, a young wildebeest will actually have the capability to run. Unfortunately though, if unable to, they are left behind by the rest of the herd as a safety precaution. Another safety precaution though that they take that you may have noticed as they were laying down, they face different directions. So if they see a predator, they sound the alarm loud enough and quick enough to make their way to safety. Now near that large giraffe there to the right is that very, very large gray animal. That is a male Patterson's Eland, fully grown at about six feet tall at the shoulder, weighing in at 2,000 pounds, leaping eight feet straight up into the air, all without having to take a running start. So a very impressive animal. Females won't be as tall as the male that you just saw back there, won't be as bulked up or heavy by a few hundred pounds or so, they're a bit lighter. Now we're heading on over to Tembo Country, and it looks like a lot of trees have been taken down already as we make our way on over there, and I spot an elephant up ahead, so we have found a Tembo. We'll see if we can find some more as we make our way forward. It looks like there's one a little bit higher up that hill over there to that right-hand side. But the watering holes like you see here to the right in just a second are great places to spot elephants. They need to stay hydrated just like we do. An elephant's trunk consists of thousands and thousands of muscles, allowing them to store about five gallons of water at one point in time within that trunk. You notice this one's eating right now, using that trunk to gather food up to its mouth. They'll throw on their sunscreen, consisting grass, hay, dirt, and mud. They will throw it on their bodies, going around in it, sitting down in it, whatever it takes. Notice this one's flapping your ears back and forth. You can see those large veins on those ears. It helps decrease their body temperature anywhere from seven to nine degrees. Now you look closely over here to the left. You're gonna see a family of mandrels. Very rare sight to see, very shy, very reclusive animals. They like to use that gray fur as a natural camouflage, blending in with all of their surroundings. Now, based off of size, looks like we have some younger ones and some females. Males are 100 pounds, females 25 to 30. Definitely a huge size difference, but there's also a coloration difference. Males will have a gray, blue, and red color to both sides of the body. Females, just a small portion on their face, but they are the largest monkey with also the shortest tail. Now, pretty cool thing about mandrels, they have extra pouches in their mouth that they store food in for later on. So if they're not as hungry as they thought they were, say they needed to make a quick getaway to get to safety, they just store the food in their mouth for later on. And then when they're hungry, they'll have something to eat and they don't have to search for it later. Now we are going to continue to pull on forward and make our way on over to Tembo Country. We started out with a lot of luck by finding those two elephants right away. 
Now the gestation period for an elephant is actually going to be the longest, about 22 months. So it oh takes almost God. two full years for one elephant calf to arrive. <laughs> now with it taking as long as it does, that little baby isn't so little when it's born. It stands at about three feet tall, weighing in at roughly 300 pounds. Now for a good portion of their childhood, at least during the daytime, they are watched over by everybody pretty much but mom. So that'll be aunts, cousins, sisters, if brothers are still living in the herd. And then when it's time for bed, that's when the matriarch will call them all together and the young ones have the bonding time with mom. However, when they reach the ages of 13 to 15, a male elephant will actually leave home being kicked out of the herd. They wind up getting sent to live the life of a bachelor for a good part of the rest of their days. Sometimes they form smaller bachelor herds, but for a good majority of it, they're by themselves. With that being a matriarch society, the pack of Durham herd, they'll be ran by the oldest and wisest female. Now we've made our way here to Tambo Country, and we're going to pass through some red clay pits. And you look around us, there's a lot of tusks and a lot of footprints within this place. That's a good sign as to either why we just found elephants and hopefully a good indication that we might find some more up ahead. We'll eat this clay though. It's packed full of the vitamins, minerals, nutrients, proteins, you name it, all the good things that they need in their system, just like we do on a daily basis. I do see some more up ahead, so we'll keep pulling on forward. Now they'll stay in a clay pit a couple of days, sometimes even all the way up to a week. It really just depends on if there's enough clay for each elephant to have as a meal see a younger one up ahead so we'll make our way on over toward it but each elephant eats anywhere from three to six hundred pounds of food per day based off of more so gender and size but each elephant loses about 150 pounds of weight per day just from simply going to the bathroom so obviously it's important their intake is significantly larger than their outtake now we're gonna go see this little lady up ahead here to the left hand side you'll notice she is the only one that does not have tusks just like when we we're born as a human baby we don't have our teeth baby elephants they don't have the tusks they have to grow them in over time made out of ivory though one thing that the males and the females have in common is those ivory tusks now unfortunately being made out of ivory they are targeted for them on a daily basis heavily and illegally poached that's at an average of about 96 per day my friends when you break that down even further that's one elephant every 15 to 20 minutes it's very important that we do our part to keep these animals as safe as we can especially because it takes so long for just one to be born. Now they also lose their lives due to loss of habitat on a daily basis. Their homes are mined for a mineral called coltan. Now if you're not quite sure what coltan, coltan is, it's actually the same stuff to make up our electronics, such as our cell phones, laptops, tablets, cameras, iPods, all the fun cool things we use on a daily basis. Now a very easy way to help save those animals, elephants, and even mandrels is to recycle your electronics. Whether maybe it's broken, maybe it's just laying around the house and you don't use it as often as you do, maybe you just simply upgrade it to a new system. Such a small effort on our end can actually make a di big difference in their lives, allowing them to still have a place to live out in the wild. So remember that the next time you have to get a new phone because your old one broke, once you've transferred everything over, make that small effort, recycle it, so that way we can hopefully slow down and stop this process. Now down here to the left hand side, they're a bit vocal right now, looks like a lot of them are kind of sleeping. There's a uh, flamboyance, a greater flamingo here to the left, the larger pink birds. Now, when hatched, they start out the color gray, taking one to two years of a diet of brine shrimp and beta carotene, gaining their coloration. Standing, though, at a full five feet taller than the first six months of life, they're the tallest, but also the lightest shade of pink of flamingo species. And that was a smaller flamboyance, they'll stay in the larger numbers within the hundreds. Now, we've made our way through more of the savannah. And I see a lot of larger mud pits in these areas, and a lot of mud has already been rubbed off on a lot of rocks and trees and logs, it looks like, so that could be a good sign. A lot of animals like to use that mud as a sunscreen and to keep themselves nice and cool. Out here on the eastern part of the savannah, we're going to keep our eyes open today for a crash of white rhino. So we'll see if we can look out at all. As we look for that crash, we're also going to look up on these hills to the left to see if we can find some cheetahs. Cheetahs love to use their spots to hide within the brush of these hills, so look for ear twitches and tail flips. We have a bright white patch on the end of their tail. I do spot when you look straight up the hill past all of those trees. You can see it's laying flat, but it's got its head popped up. It just oh, turned to us, actually. Let's see if we can find some more. It kind of looks more like a bright yellowish looking log almost. As we make the turn, you can still kind of see it. Just continue to turn. See if we can find some more. Now, it's a little bit easier to see them with the sun being blown out oh, by the clouds because what happens is the sunlight will be mimicked through the trees and then they kind of blend in, which is great for a cheetah, especially when they're hunting during the daytime and sneaking up on their prey. Obviously, it makes it a bit difficult for us to see them. You can see a little bit better if you look across from us about your 10 o'clock or so up there on that hill. 
Fastest land animal though, reaching a speed of 70 miles per hour all while running with that uneven tail. Claws that don't retract into their paws. They also have an enlarged heart and enlarged lungs, giving them the blood and oxygen flow that they need to be able to chase it down their prey. Now their body only allows them a short amount of time to do so, 45 seconds to a minute, but they can reach that top speed of 70 within about four seconds. Now if they don't capture their prey within that short amount of time the body gives them, unfortunately the cheetah does go hungry for an entire day. It takes almost a full 24 hours for their body to rest up and recuperate. So they have to feel very confident with themselves when it goes to hunting to make sure that they can capture their food. A diurnal animal, hunting during the daytime, sleeping during the nighttime. They actually have tear shapes that run from each eye down to their mouth to reflect the sun off of their face. Now, right over here to this left-hand side, this large rock formation, called the Kopi, is known to be home to a pride of lions. Now, the lion pride will typically be one male, the rest then all females and their cubs. About 40 lions live within one pride. A very inactive animal, though, for about 20 hours of the day. That's going to be sleeping, lounging around, resting up, conserving their energy, staying in the shaded parts, whether it's of the trees or the kopis, pretty much just conserving their energy as much as they possibly can. Now, they're going to obviously be resting during the daytime, making them a nocturnal hunter. During the daytime, our eyesights are actually very similar to that of the lion, so if we see any, they're going to have the same eyesight, just like that female right up ahead, so we'll pull just a bit farther forward. Pretty good view of her. During the nighttime, though, their eyesight is six times stronger than ours is, making that lady's job a little bit easier when it comes to seeing what she's chasing down while they reach a speed of 40 miles per hour. Now, the ones to actually do the hunting will be the females. The male stays back. He'll guard the kopi. He'll guard the cubs. Only does about 10% of the actual hunt itself. Still getting to eat, though, before the rest of the pride. Now, you would think with the eyesight at nighttime, the agility, and the numbers that they would hunt in, they'd be pretty successful when it comes to their food, when it comes to capturing it. If you recall, we talked about the wild dogs not too long ago, about how they're 90 to a 95% success rate. Unfortunately for the lions, only about one in every 15 hunts is going to be a successful one. So they got to kind of kind of work on that. Oh, it looks like this guy's just taking a nap over here, so we'll pull around. Again, a very normal thing to see. Now the older he gets, the darker his mane becomes, so you can see he's still fairly young. He has that bright, beautiful yellow coloration in the front of his mane. But when he ages, it's going to turn to a darker shade of brown and black. Now when fully projecting their roar, they can actually be heard from about five miles away. Magnificent climbers as well, they'll climb high up into trees and kopis, keeping a higher surveillance of all that call the savanna their home, watching all those migration patterns as well. Now, when they have successfully caught their prey, their tongues are so strong that with just one lick to the carcass, it could actually clear it clean. Little spikes of keratin will do the trick. Keratin is actually the same stuff, again, to make up our hair and our fingernails, the horns of the rhinos. But if any of you have a house cat at home, you know it has that kind of rough, weird, dry sandpaper texture to it. That's the exact same texture that's on the tongue of a lion, just obviously a lot stronger. Now, over here to the left, as we pull forward, a couple of, actually, it looks like a few warthog. Related to the domesticated pig, they're the largest burrowing animal. They will use those sharp tusks to dig out burrows in the grounds which they live in, backing in with the tusks pointed out to fend off predators from taking their land or their lives. Also notorious though for taking over other animals' homes while they're being lived in by the original owner and not at that point in time. Now their name in Swahili is Pumba, but Pumba translates to foolish or crazy. Now they're going to hang out in mud pits throughout the day. You can see there are some mud pits over there. Using that as a sunscreen, helping them to keep them nice and cool. But their bodies attack or uh, attract a lot of bugs, so it kind of helps them relieve them of all those. Over there to that right hand side, those are Bont Bok also known as the colorful buck. You look at them, two shades of brown, light on top, dark on the sides. When it's nice and sunny out and it beams down on that side coat, it actually turns into a glossy shade of purple. Unfortunately, because of that glossy shade of purple, legally poached almost to extinction back in the day with only 17 remaining for their horns, their meat, and their coats. A man was able to get them onto his land, transfer them into the reserve, and their numbers are thriving in the thousands. A little bit further off laying down are some white rhino. Weighing in at 5,000 pounds, they charge at 35 miles an hour. Eyesight's not so great, so they depend on their sense of smell and hearing to get by, only seeing a few feet in front of them. Unfortunately, though, illegally poached for the keratin horn, just like the black rhino. They're actually the southern white rhino that you just saw, the heavily populated ones, with about 20,000 left in the world, only a total of 29,000 
rhinos remain though as a whole. So it's important that we do our part to keep these animals safe. Now those are ostrich over there, females based off of coloration. Males are jet black, ladies are going to be more of the gray that you just saw. The tallest and largest bird, however, a flightless one as they use their massive wings to make the directions that they run because they can reach a speed of 40 miles an hour. Now we've left the savannah and are here at the Magadi Glen, one of the newest spots on the reserve made possible by contributions from the Disney Conservation Fund, allowing us to bring in new animals that are having more difficulties out in the wild like we've seen so far throughout the reserve. A lot of them are gonna be a little bit shyer. Sometimes we look out and we spot scimitar horned oryx. So we'll keep our eyes open. I do however see some larger white birds with black wings. They are called yellow-billed stork up ahead. Yellow-billed stork nest in pairs like these two getting a pink coloring on their wings during the mating season. Their name obviously comes from that long yellow bill that they have. They use it to dig to the ground to search for meat. Being carnivorous, eating anything from snakes, lizards, toads, smaller birds, fish, and even rodents. For a stork, fairly small, at only three feet tall, with a wingspan of five feet in length. Now my friends, these are the gates to the reserve, so we are gonna start to head on out and make our way on up to the warden post, where they're gonna drop you all off. So you can be on your way to the village of Harambe or wherever else your travels are taking you here in Africa. But if you are wanting to see more animals, I'm going to suggest Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail. It is a 20 minute trip. It's all self-guided so you can take your time with it. Sometimes you look out and you find western lowland gorillas, an underwater viewing area of hippos, there are meerkats, snake and mole rats, grevy zebras, oak copies, smaller reptiles and animals as well. Great place to earn your wilderness explorer badge is about four or five at that location. But for riding the safari, you need to know you've been on the Simba One. Now for all my friends on board, please keep in mind all these animals you are seeing today at Animal Kingdom. Unfortunately, pollution, loss of habitat, illegal poaching, a lot of those things are leading to these animals being on the endangered, critically endangered on their way are already on the extinction list out in the wild. It's very important that we do our part to keep these animals safe. Now we could donate to a conservation fund, but my friends, a very simple thing such as educating ourselves about them can make a big difference in their lives. Whether you tell your friends, your family, or your coworkers, maybe you see your favorite animal, maybe you see something cool, maybe you learn something new that you found very interesting. You never know who you guys will help inspire to go and help save these animals. So